Hello, and welcome back to Kvikminderpod, an Icelandic cinema podcast. I'm Rob Watts, and on this podcast I'm joined by my good friend Ellie Cawthorn to chat about 21st century Icelandic film. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for listening and exploring this most incredible of countries with us. Don't forget, there's a whole series already up and available wherever you get your podcasts, while Series 2 will be dropping every Monday for the next month or so. Please also join us on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Kvikminderpod. That's K-V-I-K-M-Y-N-D-A-P-O-D. Now, it's officially spooky season, so we're venturing further than ever before to the eerie and remote parts of the West Fjords, located, as the name suggests, in the northwest of Iceland. It's about time we got stuck into something scary, and this week's film, I Remember You, is just that. Based on Irsa Sigurdardatir's best-selling novel, Oscar Thor Axelsson's movie gives us graves, ghosts and grim weather. As always, we'll be discussing the film in spoilerific detail, but I thought I'd put a reminder up front for this film, as we also talk about the novel in some depth too. Right then, let's get spooked! Was that sufficiently creepy enough? Do you think? I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> no, hello. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, we're on our second episode of Second Series. We've made it this far. Well done us. We have, and we've not been, you know, killed by a ghost child yet either. And we finally made it to horror. So your two worlds aligning. Horror movies, your one big love. Icelandic movies, your other big love. This is smush. surely, yeah, smushed together. Surely this has got Rob Watts written all over it. It kind of has, yeah. Yeah, and we'll come to it because I think this could be scarier. But anyway, we'll, we'll come to that. So this week we're doing a film called I Remember You from 2017 in Icelandic. It's called Yegman Thig. Or as it reads, if you can't pronounce anything, Eggman Pig, which is <laughs> really not as frightening. <laughs> no, Yegman Thig. Which is an adaptation of a novel, our uh, second one. So second episode, second series, second adaptation. But before we get going, I will give a synopsis and then we'll get stuck into it. Mm-hmm. So, in the town of Isafjörda in the West Fjords, psychiatrist Freya is asked by local police detective Downey to assist in the case of an old woman who has hanged herself in a church. On the other side of the fjord, in the remote abandoned town of Hesteri, married couple Gartha and Katrin, plus their friend Leif, arrive by boat to turn an old house into a bed and breakfast. As strange, ghostly things start to happen in Hesteri, Freya learns that the recent death and these hauntings might be linked to two cases, 60 years apart, of missing children. Do, 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 do. Mm-hmm. So you said earlier this is based on a book. Yeah. And I know, I've heard on the grapevine that you have read this book. So I have some questions. Okay, that's good, because I also have questions about whether or not it makes sense having not read the book. So I read this book in a week, which is quite quick for me mm. in terms of just having time to read and wanting to get through it. And then I watched the film like eight hours after I finished the book. Oh, wow. So it was very fresh. And I think that might have been detrimental to my first watch of this film. Possibly. I always think you need a bit of breathing time between a book and a film adaptation. Mm-hmm. Personally, because otherwise... You just sat there going, ooh, she had brown hair in my imagination. Ooh, it, that house looked different in my imagination. You kind of can't take the film on its own credit. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think I spent the first, well, I spent the entire time of that first watch just, that didn't happen, or that happened differently, or they've not included this bit, or that's changed. So I did go and rewatch it again closer to mm. today as we record. But I enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I did. I really enjoyed it, actually. And as you say, I mean, I think it could have been scarier. I'm not sure that that was fully the intention. We'll discuss Mm. that later. But um, I was really engrossed by it. And I did actually find it quite spooky. I have a much lower horror tolerance than you. Um, I wasn't, I don't think I'll be reflecting on it in five years time. You know, like some films like Hereditary or The Orphanage or whatever and think, Mm. Oh, God, I shouldn't have thought of that just before I go to sleep. But I did think for the moment and last night, it was quite unsettling. Yeah, the orphanage is a good comparison. Very thematically similar. Yeah, scary children. 
Well, that is one thing that I, I did think slightly, that I thought it was all very well done, but everything in it was fairly familiar, if you've seen a few horror movies. Also, my favourite horror movies are ghosty ones, mm-hmm. um, the spooky ones, especially ghost children. So, you know, somebody taking you to a place and saying, ooh, what, it's a bit strange going here. Call me if you need anything, but also there's no reception. A spooky house, a basement, a um, <laughs> unresolved trauma, missing children. You're reading a, off a list of classic horror Well, exactly, right there. Yeah. which obviously are all the kind of main plot points here. Perhaps the boat, not so much a main plot point, but you know, <laughs> you get my point. But I thought they were all well done. Sorry, we were talking about the book. Now That's I've just fine. Gone totally that, that, all of those points are 100% correct, you know. It is it is riffing on all the classic horror things that we all know, or as horror fans we know. But it is, yeah, I, I feel like I haven't seen any other Icelandic horror films like this. Mm. And just the setting, for me, le- yeah. stands it out from all the others. Yeah, yeah I was expecting jump scares or expecting ghostly figures but the locations just look horrifying. insanely horrifying it's weird isn't it because I've, i'm kind of surprised that it's taken us this long to get to a ghostly supernatural mm. spooky film because iceland seems so perfectly set up for that so the remoteness of it all yep. the coldness the snow the drama of the landscapes and also the houses in themselves you know abandoned farmhouses it seems the perfect setting. It does. It is crazy to me that that it's that the Icelandic film industry isn't just chock full of <laughs> yeah. ghost stories or, or, or horror films in general. And also, there aren't that many. it's very much from what we've learned from the other films, a culture and a society that's really like grounded in, in the past and tradition and mm-hmm. old ways and family ties, which again is a huge horror trope. Yeah, you'd think actually that this film could tie slightly more into... The ideas of family mm. that we've seen present amongst Icelandic people and films and, and everything. So I thought that was interesting that it is a film centered around the loss of a family member, but mm. it doesn't explore that in, it explores it in a kind of horror film way, but it doesn't go much yeah. deeper than that. Yeah. So how does it compare to the book? Like, is would you call the book a horror book, a supernatural book? Because also we should say it's also got this very much of a like Scandi noir mm. police procedural kind of storyline also going on. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Because you've got these two parallel plots and the novel is exactly the same in that respect. It's got Freya's, uh, he's a psychiatrist, <laughs> a doctor. I mean... I want to fact check this. Come on. How is he... I feel like in the film, at least, it was not even, they didn't even attempt really to explain why a psychiatrist was then just investigating <laughs> this, like fully involved in this crime investigation, which surely relied on evidence which any random member of the public shouldn't just be allowed to see. No, I mean, the book doesn't try that much harder, really. He's a psychiatrist. It's such a remote place that he's a psychiatrist. He's also, we see him at one point being like a GP, just like yeah. t- checking on a kid's knee or something. And I guess Downey, the police detective, needed someone to I, I mean know, to, to, to assess the body. So, you're trying to explain this and clutching at straws, yeah, which shows... I think, I, yeah, I think he's just there in his role as a doctor rather than a psychiatrist initially. Mm. But then as it goes through, we realise actually what he knows about psychiatry is kind of helpful. Yeah, I kind of just thought, right, this is what's happening don't ask questions just go with it and i think that's the way to do it the idea of somebody that's not a detective solving a crime and being like drawn into an investigation is a classic in books in films oh so sometimes you just have to accept the trope and be like doesn't make any sense that he'd be doing an autopsy as a psychiatrist but fine no exactly it's interesting because irsa sigurd who wrote the novel i remember you she has written a lot of crime novels, Nordic noir novels. So mm-hmm. the the majority of the novels of hers that I've read are based around a lawyer called Thora Guzmansdottir who solves crimes. She's uh. a lawyer. She's not a police detective. So she's taking on cases for people that maybe the police won't take on anymore. Or they might be cold cases and things like that. But lots of those novels are supernaturally tinged as well. Oh, really? Yeah, so... 
that's what I quite like about her writing is that there's always this element of, oh, maybe it's not as clear cut as, as you might think. And these weird goings on, while they might end up having a sort of natural human outcome, mm. sometimes they're not. Because I think some people find that a bit hard to categorise, don't they? They like things that they're like, okay, this is a police procedural, so I know what structure I'm going to get. Or this is a haunted house horror film, and I know what that's going to look like. And yeah, it's kind of strange to see them mashed together. And I quite like that because you're like, ooh. I didn't know whether it was going to end up being that it was supernatural or not supernatural so it's kind of nice to have that unexpected element Mm. to it which i don't think you would have if it was just a straight horror or a straight police procedural Þessi kross á að vera í kirkjugarðinu, við sá það í gær. Það var að hóla þess að það hefði verið kross og svo er hann líka að taka. Hvernulegt? Myndur þú telja að sama manneskjan hafi verið að verki í bæði skiptin? Já, algjörlega. Ég meina, það er útilokað þessi tilviðin. Sko, þessi mynd fannst á þessum tíma á heimilega þessa drengs hér, Bernandusa Péturssonar. Þetta eru fóreldrarnir. Móðurinn lést við fæðingu Bernandusar. Halló! Yes, I think the novel and the film both do quite a good job of making you kind of guess for at least a little while whether it might be real or not. Especially because you've got, there's just a kid running around terrorising three people in a remote location. I mean, my brain says that's not possible. And in the, no- in the novel, they explore it much more, where the characters explicitly say no child could have survived here even in the last kind of week, let alone three years or whatever it is since that or 60 Mm. years since the ghost Bernadus died or or whatever Um, but it still keeps you guessing anyway Mm. which I quite like but to me this the film felt a lot more like it was a ghost story than a police procedural yeah I didn't go into it I mean obviously I had all the background information but it didn't feel like we were just gonna follow Erlander solving a crime yeah it certainly felt like okay this is Freya's story and this is Gartha, Katrin and Leif's story. Obviously, at some point, they're going to meet. Like, that's inevitable. I, well, um, it's interesting because obviously you've read the book, so you knew how these two storylines were going to... Converge. Co- yeah, converge. Whereas I didn't. And actually, I did think it did quite a good job of keeping that unexpected. And I didn't, I didn't see how they were going to merge to begin with. So I first thought that, obviously... Katrin alluded to some loss in her life mm. and said, you know, I've accepted he's gone. Yeah. And then we had Frere kind of saying, obviously talking about his missing child. That's and... one of my favourite moments of dialogue. It's so bad. When <laughs> uh, he's at the church talking to Sveinbjörn from Woman at War. <laughs> yeah. And the, the guy's like, uh, I, that was very kind of you to say those things to me, especially since, you know, you're thinking, and he goes... Yes, it's been three years since we lost our Benny. Yes, so uh, (laughs) the exposition is absolutely (laughs) unnecessary. Children don't go missing in Iceland, but that's what happened to my son. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that was a bit um, heavy handed. But because she she kind of alluded to it more vaguely and we didn't find out till a bit later, I thought that what was going to happen was that... I also obviously didn't know about this time 
shift mm. thing that that these two storylines were running along different times major spoiler alert oh yeah um so i obviously assumed as you do that they're running along parallel yeah of course and i thought that katrin was the mother of benny oh interesting because i thought how are these two stories going to come together he clearly has a missing child she clearly has some kind of missing male child well not missing but obviously it turns out that she's had a stillbirth Mm. but before that became clear that's where i predicted it was going to be going reading the novel i had very similar thoughts Mm. and i now can't remember quite how the, the novel ends but that was certainly something i was like Okay, so, yeah, they've lost a baby. Mm. There's got to be a way that Freya and Katrin must be related. On on also the note of things that you just kind of were like, I'll accept that this is fine, but I feel like it could have been better explained, was um, their kind of reasons for going out to what I kept thinking of as an island, but isn't an island. No, it's just a very remote town mm-hmm. on the other side of a huge fjord like yeah i think i don't know whether they don't really mention it in the film but no. it's a very long way from the nearest actual town and to walk there they'd probably end up like dying on the way at the very end they say that katrin probably tried to walk to safety but got lost or you know mm. succumbed to the cold but um the, their kind of reasons for going there I didn't feel like we're incredibly well, well explained. What, you mean the uh, the montage of them doing up the so, B and B wasn't okay, enough so for you? Okay, so they're setting up a B and B, but why is their friend also involved in this? Why were the husband and the friend there last summer in somebody else in a doc in the quote doctor's house, mm. but nobody lives in the doctor's house? Okay, yes, that none none of that was really touched on. And this is why it's so good to have the background knowledge. I mean, it, one of the main differences in the book is that, yes, Katrin and Garth are a, a couple, they've been married for ages, but Leif has recently lost her husband, Aina. Ah. So she's you know, sort of grieving for her loss. And the idea was that Garth and Aina had come up with this plan to buy this house and turn it into a bed and breakfast. In the previous mm. summer, the three of them, minus Katrin, mm. Uh, had gone to check it all out, to scope it, and they'd stayed in the doctor's house because in the summer, that was one of the houses that you could get into. Mm. Um, And it was just easier for them to stay there while they assessed what work needed to be done on the house, I guess. And so in the film, I assume that's what they were doing, just the two of them. And Katrin had obviously just lost the baby, so she didn't go. Mm. Uh, I feel like you just had to kind of... They were like... There's too much to explain there. We need to get onto the spooky stuff. Let's just be like, they're here now. Let's just roll with it. I think the film does that with so many plot points from the novel as well. Mm. Just, it's like, okay, well, we can't spend 10 minutes explaining that Aina had died mm. and that now Leaf is with them. And in the novel, she's the one who's suffering. Mm. Katrin hasn't suffered anything. But what I think the film does really well is takes the themes and ideas and some of the plot points, specific ones, and reuses them to make a much tighter, more simple Mm. narrative. Uh, And on second watch, I was actually in admiration of how they'd done that and when I could step back and see how everything tied together quite nicely. Mm. Well, I can definitely see how stuff, why they made those decisions because already there's a lot that you're cramming into it in terms Mm. of that you have these two storylines, which are both fairly kind of complex and running alongside each other and if you'd brought in all these additional elements which obviously make up the texture of a book you'd just be completely overwhelmed wouldn't you absolutely yeah all those extra layers that you don't need um and it does feel stripped back but did that was that detrimental really i I know you're saying you're saying that you know it would be good to have these explained but if it doesn't doesn't really need it, if you just go along with it. Yeah, I think it was probably wise to do so and not get too bogged down in the in the extra stuff. Mm. I was a bit disappointed though that the the most p- pointless little scene that would never have made it in the film wasn't in the film because there's a moment where Freya is just like contemplating something and he's sat outside this fish restaurant in Isafjorda and I was like. <gasps> I've been there. 
<laughs> so basically, you wanted them to include a scene because you'd been there. Yeah. <laughs> like, we, if we're spending... If our main location is the one, like, main town in the Westfields, I want to see some of it. And I want to see the restaurant I went to, which was amazing. Well, but, yeah, what can you what, what can you tell me about... Because we didn't also any, get any explanation, really, about the the place that they're setting up this B&B, which I don't hmm. think you need because you get everything you need to know, which is it's really remote... It's kind of spooky. Okay, go. Yeah. But that's a real place then? Mm-hmm. If you look on Google Maps, you can see there's only like five houses, literally. They, they obviously just went to history and filmed there. So yeah, the West Fjords are absolutely magnificent. But East of Fjord is this big town. I say big. It's, it's a town of some description. It has like three restaurants and a couple of bars. And it has a hospital, which, you know, we see in the film, and it has a hotel, which I never saw when I was there. But that whole area is so remote that no one really lives there anymore because there's no jobs. There's no reason to be there, except for in the summer when the tourists come and they need somewhere to stay. Now, I must have stayed not too far from Hysteria. I can't quite remember. But to set up a and b in that area would be quite a good idea in the summer because you'd, it would be full every day that there's daylight. So it makes sense that they would try and renovate and make some money. And in the novel, they're like quite hard up for cash. So they need this to go well. And it, I mean, it looks terrifying in the winter, but it probably looks absolutely stunning in the summer, which we don't get to see, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Welcome in the end to the scene. Get a little draw. Ah. She's better to go after a kid or old guest, let me get it. I don't know if I'm going to go to Starting from the top, mm. I did think the opening was very creepy. As and in it, the titles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sets it out as... You're getting a horror film here. Welcome. This is a horror film with um, photos of children with their faces crossed out. <laughs> Another horror movie cliche um, and spooky kind of unsettling music. Yeah, that sound design over the titles is horrible. It's very Twin Peaks The Return, actually, like David Lynch kind of sound design, which the film doesn't embrace as much as it should. No, I did. I was going to say... If we're talking about music, I felt at points... Actually, I didn't notice it further on, but at the start, it did feel a bit heavy-handed and at some point. So, yeah, this is scary. So <laughs> the main point where I noticed it was when they were getting the boat. And obviously, it's quite an innocuous scene because they're not, they don't know that they're going to a haunted house yet. But we know, we very, very much know because it's like... Oh. Yeah. Spooky, spooky. Mist. Everything is, uh, yeah, set up for us to go, oh God, this is a bad idea. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, those titles are, are fantastic. And they sort of set up some of the ideas of mm. the film and a bit of background. And I guess quite a good way of saving time of tying in the opening event mm -hmm. into the title sequence. So once we're through the titles, we just get going. Straight into you the know, action. We see, I mean, the whole the title sequence reminded me of the film Sinister, which is very much yes. to do with old footage and things like that. And I think there's a lot of hanging in that as well. But we see this old lady destroying a church and then hanging herself. And obviously that's when the film starts and Freya goes to investigate. But from there, it's all a kind of story about how all these old people have started dying recently, isn't it? That makes it sound a lot less sinister. <laughs> <laughs> All these old people have started dying in mysterious circumstances, yes. you should say. Yeah, you're right. They are sort of accidents, aren't they? 
ways that people would never normally die, including mm. a lady falling on garden shears in the garden. Which is exactly something that happens in Hot Fuzz. Oh, <laughs> yes, that's true. With an old woman in that as well. So yeah. Clearly, if you're thinking of ways to kill off an old woman, garden shears are the way to go. I mean, what else do old ladies do except for garden? N- knitting needles. Knitting needles, Death garden shears. Knitting needles. <laughs> Leslie Tiller was fucking murdered. Just like Tim Messenger. Yes. George Merchant. Yes. And Eve Draper. Yes. Martin Blower. No, actually. Really? Cause he fucking was. Thank you, Danny. Oh, murder, murder, murder. Change the fucking record. Thank you, Andy. Come on, Sergeant. You've got to accept it was just another nasty accident. What are you suggesting? That Leslie Tiller tripped and fell on her own shears? Ben Fletcher fell on his pitchfork the other week. Yeah, accidents happen all the time. What makes you think it was murder? (laughs) Because I was there! But it's very true. These accidents happen. And they all end up having crosses on their backs. Mm. Which is intriguing. And for somehow, the police detective's like, this reminds me of when a boy went missing and he had crosses on his back. Like, there's no logical... Mm. And this is a 60-year-old case, and Dan is like, it reminds me of that. Is that how that? Is that how the two stories, two cases get linked? I'm not sure. I mean, I think a lot of the police work seems very like, oh, yeah, that makes me think of this case, or, oh, I knew that patient in mm. the hospital, or... Oh, yeah, that rings a bell with the the CCTV from this, in which you would think, hmm, that sounds a bit implausible, but fine, because it's that's ju- the genre. We, we, we're not watching an actual police procedural. No. We are watching a supernatural film, and these police figures are a means to get from one bit exactly. to the other. Like, I don't want to see them. Nest- we see, in the we archives. Do see, we see Freya go to the archives once. But we don't need a whole kind of The Ring style uh, research half an hour, do we? Yeah, no, I'll accept that. And so it all basically becomes linked to the case of a missing boy from 1956 Mm. called Bernadus. Yeah, that's a good name, isn't it? It's a very good name, yeah. It's got quite a kind of um, sinister monk vibe. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it sounds very religious. Mm. Which is exactly right, because the whole sort of idea behind why he was um, scarred is that his father was a religious fanatic and beat his son and all of this and was really outraged that the church in Hestery, where they used to live, had been moved to another place, which is where Hatler had died. I think in the novel it's Suthavik, which is another town nearby. And that's it. And then so the the dad was accused of, of sort of killing or doing something to Bernardus, but no one knows what happened because his body was never found. Mm. So we've got this story from 60 years ago about a boy who was tortured and systematically bullied at school uh, who goes missing, which links somewhat strangely to Freya's backstory. Yeah, that link was kind of... Was it tenuous? I don't know. Is that unfair? I think it's one of those plot contrivances that any supernatural or crime drama will have. Like, if you don't... Because I'm reading some of these novels recently. You think like, oh, well, that would never happen. But it needs to happen. Otherwise, this story doesn't exist. And I obviously, I get that sometimes that can be pushed too much. And you're just like, well, I don't believe it. And now I've lost all faith in the integrity of the story. But 60 years apart, you know, it happens sometimes. So the idea is that Bernadus ran away, got on a boat, ended up in the West Fjords. Wandered around for a while, starved to death, or just kind of like elected to die? Well, yeah, so he got bullied and ran and jumped on that boat, which led to to Hestery, which is where he grew up. So he goes and sees his mum's grave, Mm -hmm. and then the boat goes back to the main town before he gets a chance to get back on it. That's what what specifically says in the novel. And you do get a shot of the boat uh, going away while Bernard is, is on the island. And yeah, I think he's just like, Oh shit! Um, and eventually he goes to the warmest place, which is you know on the earth underneath the house, which the is basement. where he then dies. Yeah, mm. uh, because he doesn't have any other options. It's very dark. <laughs> it is very dark. And then, of course, the parallel in the contemporary time is that Benny Freya's son mm-hmm. also ends up in the West Fjords in the same place. Yeah. 
But did you get the sense that the idea is that Bernadus's ghost, spirit, what have you, is kind of calling him there or like summoning him or dragging him down somehow? Or was it like pure coincidence? As in dragging Benny? Yeah, as in like he, he wanted some company or he was, <laughs> I mean, say this, like he's just not a creepy ghost. But, but that, I think that's yeah. what ghosts want when they can't. Then they haven't got anything else. Like, obviously yeah. wants to be found, I think is the main thing. But I don't think he... I, originally, I don't think he was calling Benny, and that's how he ended up there. But once Benny was there, he used Benny to get people over there to be found, which is why the ending is so sad. Ah. Show till. Benny er fastur. Fastur milli tvekja heima. Stundum þegar ekki er hægt að gera upp endalokin í lífi fólks, þá kemst það ekki á næsta tilvörustig. Eins og til dæmis þegar ekkert lík finnst eða engin veit neitt um hvað gerðist. Það eina sem getur frelsa þessa sálir úr fjötrum er að líkamslíf er þeirra finnist og að ráðgátan um endalok þeirra leysist. And the medium lawyer person, I mean... Why he's a medium and a lawyer, I don't <laughs> yeah. know. I know lots of Icelanders what? have multiple jobs, but wow. <laughs> I was like, how does this medium have such a nice office and a receptionist? Yeah, it was very strange. To me, medium and lawyer are not two professions that go hand in hand. No, not for me either. In the novel, I know I'm. it's inevitable I'm going to be talking about the novel as much as I didn't want to keep referring to it. But in the novel, it is very much a sort of classic stereotype hippie medium person lady mm. with you know frayed sleeves and long hair and oh really so i i don't know what the that's a strange choice then to make him kind of a corporate medium mm. in yeah. a boardroom I, i'm not sure that it really made any difference other than maybe they thought it was too much of a stereotype to have a medium mm. be your classic medium nappi mm. bernotus Það kemur ítrekkað upp í vitinu, áhans ég geti útskýrt hvað það þýðir. Yeah, the medium lawyer, he basically says Bernadus is using Benny, because Benny has somehow woken up Bernadus from his ghost sleep and <laughs> is going to use Benny to get people over to Hesteri to hopefully uncover his body, I think. Mm, but um, he'd already got people over there to uncover his body, but it didn't quite work. Yeah, I, everyone's just so ignorant, I think. Actually, I've just found a plot con inconsistency oh, oh, here. Oh, no. Okay. Which is, right, Bernadus wants to be found so that he can move to a higher plane of existence and mm. not be trapped as a tormented ghost, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. Yep. So, he gets... They go over to the island... They find his body, don't they? Catrin finds, his, finds body. his body yeah. in the basement. And they say, we found his body. We need to get the boat back. Blah, 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 blah. And then he lures Gartha and Leif to that decrepit building. Mm. Essentially lures them to a place where they're going to die because the tower falls on them. Yep. So then basically he's ruined the whole thing because he was going to be... They would have just gone to the authorities when the boat came back, said, oh, there's some random boy's body in this basement, and he would have been released. I don't think that's actually what he wants. What he wants is a mother. Oh, uh, well, see, I thought his I thought his plan had changed after, <laughs> really? after Gar because Gartha, they, they, do go in, they do go into the basement or the cellar that no one ever seems to notice, Can except I, when the ghost opens I it. I also have a beef with this, that they say, <laughs> we did an extensive search her body an extensive search but they didn't think oh maybe there's a basement no it's true but then and no one ever seems to check that there's a basement but i think because i'm sure gather says something like there's a corpse in here yeah and then just carries on as <laughs> normal i feel like bernardus is like okay well i don't need you to you don't seem to care that much about you adulterous. me i'll just have katrin because she looks like my mum um, and I want some company. Uh, so I'll lure them down to the thing and kill them. I think that's the point of where the plot, his his idea of getting found slash being left changes maybe, but it is a bit of a wild jump, I think. 
I'll um, accept that. That sounds fine. But uh, I mean, in relation to that as well, Katrin in the novel isn't the only one to experience the ghostliness, which oh. in the film, I think, I think the film lets itself down a little bit by sort of relying on only one person experiencing this strange stuff so that the others can be a bit like, she's crazy. I No, I thought that was quite good because if we're going with this idea that he wants her to kind of remain with him or to be his mother or that she's similar to his mother mm. and also she's had this loss and she wants a child, it would actually make sense to me that he would almost like target her yeah. Um, for the hauntings. And no, the yeah. other two are kind of irrelevant. That is a good point, actually, because that's such a big change from the novel that that does work, actually, mm. in the context of the film. Because one of the big set pieces in the novel, which I'd like to talk about, is the whaling station that's falling down. Mm. And in the novel, so this is, this, is one of, this is one of the things about the film I think did a really good job of changing one of the key scenes. So in the novel... That whaling station is rigged by Gartha and Leaf to kill Katrin. What? Because they're having this affair and they just want to get on with it. So they lure her to there, set it, and it all falls on. It's all supposed to fall on Katrin, but it doesn't kill her. She manages to get out of the way because Bernard just saves her, like by scaring uh. her, which means she avoids the chimney and everything falling on top of her. Because the way they reveal the affair... Is very different in the novel. At one point, Katrin is trying to take photos of what might be in the basement Ugh. with a camera. And she's sort of just sticking her hand down into the hole and taking yeah. photos. And then she sat there in the kitchen. Her and Leaf are both injured, I think, at this point. And she looks at the camera and can't see anything, but presses that wrong arrow. No! And it, guess what's on the camera? Nudies. Yeah, photos of uh, Leaf and Gartha. And so she discovers that. I think that's the end of both of them, pretty much, because then Bernadouce comes and strangles Katrin to death. Oh, so it is quite different. So I feel like um, it was quite well laid out um, that there was going to be some kind of affair thing going on, or at least that, something. Because that was one of my were, questions to There you. were a lot of meaningful looks mm. and moments of kind of jumping away from each other. Yeah, there was one moment when Katrin comes back from finding the grave mm. and she walks in and they're both just kind of like looking at each other and then look away. And I was wondering whether you had sort of noticed all yes, of that. Yes, 100%. Yeah. So when it got to the point where they uncovered it fully, I was like, well, yeah, obviously. I quite liked how they did that, though, because like Katrin was just like, you've been sleeping with each other, haven't you? And yeah. he's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, made it all a bit more simple. I think it sounds like for the for the film's purposes that what they the choices they made to deviate from the book there were probably good. In many ways, especially the whole love triangle and the way that they killed off the characters i thought was worked really well in the novel in the film yeah and i mean if bernardus strangled Catherine in in the book i think also that then definitely i mean obviously he's actually killed loads of people hasn't he so he's probably not incredibly nice but it replaced the emphasis on him just being like a sad child in, in the yeah, film. Yeah. You know, that all he wants was just someone to love him and some company. Whereas if he'd killed her in the same ways in the book, that's somewhat undermined. Yeah, I think you're right. That's a key difference. Like he's quite, it's a lot more malevolent in the novel. Whereas in the film, the medium just try to say like the spirits that have been around for longer, they get stronger mm -hmm. and they get angrier. But in this, it does feel like he's got stronger but he's not necessarily 
Well, it's it's a sense, isn't it, that in any horror film, any ghost, the kind of law of it has to be that a ghost has a motivation, Mm. right? Yeah. So in the film, he does have a coherent and a consistent motivation, which is revenge on the bullies Mm -hmm. and sad and lonely, I want a mum and someone to love. Yeah. And that is pretty consistent throughout. Absolutely. And we might as well just talk about that that part of the ending, because there's two stories have their own endings, don't they? And that specific story, the Gartha Leaf Katrin one, ends with Katrin having found Gartha and Leaf dying. Ugh. Gartha's eye. Hor- horrible. Oh, good good makeup effects on that. Uh, and then finding Leaf somewhat breathing, but you know, spitting out blood. So she goes to call for help. But while she's up there, before she gets a chance, she sees in a in a twist that isn't in the novel that Leaf is pregnant with Gartha's baby. Which is like an ultimate, like kick in the teeth, mm. I, sus- I suppose. Yeah. And uh, and that's so she then decides not to save Leaf at all. I thought that was a really powerful moment. Although I was like, she's probably gonna die anyway, so it may not make too much difference. But the no, point but- is the the choice made to not try and save her. The choice made not to try and save her, and then also the choice not to actually save herself either. That she mm. chooses not to call for help, but instead just goes into the house and is like. I'm going to lie here too and die. die, which is, oh my God. Horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> so horrendous. She's not going to die that quickly. She's going to take a long, well, maybe Bernard just will help her along the God, way of that, it. That's a creepy, proper creepy moment when she lies down and he appears behind her, yeah. pulls the hair around her ear and just lies back down. He's, he's horrible looking. I didn't find him hugely creepy. Okay, what did you think were some of the most unsettling moments? And then we could maybe go back to the ending a little bit. Mm. I mean, we didn't. I didn't quite get into all the jump scares, did I? But no. the jump scares, the river one, where Catherine's <gasps> yes. collecting the beer, finds the cross, and then suddenly there's this hooded figure behind her. Zombie man, which is, I guess, Bernardus. Yeah. Like, what this film doesn't do is go completely James Wan, The Conjuring, and... Every two seconds, there's a loud noise and something scares you shitless. But I think that's good. Mm. I think it, that would have been too much. And weirdly, some of the most creepy moments, one of the moments that actually made me go, oh, was not a supernatural one. It was when Katrin and Gartha were having sex. Oh, yeah. And Leaf was in the room and they assume she's asleep. And you see it from their perspective. And then the camera flips and we see her and she just opens her eyes with this like horrifying yeah. look on her face. I, I agree with you 100%. That moment is creepy as fuck. It's skin crawling. Not even it? sure why. Mm. Why have they made that the creepy moment? <laughs> that could have just been her lying there like, you know, I'm lying. I can hear you having sex. That's uncomfortable. But instead, it's like really, really unsettling. unsettling yeah. I'm trying to think of other creepiest ones. Well, there's the moment just before Gartha and Leaf die when Leaf finally sees Bernadus and his face is all scarred up and he just mm. screams. That sent chills through my through my body. Yeah. That was pretty intense. Also when Catherine is, you know, creeping about at night and then falls in the cellar for oh, the first God. time and yeah. like twists her ankle and that panic of trying to bash on the bash uh-huh. on the ceiling of the cellar saying let me out let me out it was very visceral wasn't it it's so true to life as well yeah. like, i don't know if you've ever been locked in a room i've been in a situation similar not with a dead body i was gonna but... say when have you been locked in a creepy basement <laughs> with a child's corpse <laughs> not quite but you know pa- the panic of like oh fuck i'm stuck mm. that's a very real thing whether or not you're scared that there's a ghost in the room as well yeah you know, yeah, that's pretty intense. Well, I did wonder whether Bernardus had got locked in there and that's how he died. But I don't think that was the case. I think it looks like he chose to be down there and, yeah. you know, Just let himself die. Him. There. He was trying to be warm, but the cold mm. got him overnight and that was it, I yeah. think. Um, one of the most unsettling moments for me, which is amazing because there's almost no sound at the time, is when... So Freya's out for his run, because uh, mm. we've seen that he likes to run, and... 
the older lady who hasn't died, one of the pupils who hasn't yeah. had a cross through her face, Ursula, who's apparently schizophrenic, doesn't say any words, but has previously, you know, revealed the words. Benny is somewhere green uh, mm. and at the bottom. And Freya doesn't really know what she's on about. But he's out for a late night run, sees Bernardus, follows him to the creepy boat. <laughs> And he's on the boat looking so for the brilliant. ghost. And then he looks through the window and then there's just... I'm getting chills now thinking about it. Ursula, the old lady's face, just in the window. Just... She's not screaming. She's just like, oh, without any sound. And I was like, that was... It was so unexpected and such mm. a creepy image. And the fact that they didn't even try to make it a jump scare made it even more unsettling. Yeah. That was horrible. That was a really creepy moment, actually. And I found the... Um the death of all the rocks and then the kind of shall I call for help or not mm. sequence. Not not scary in a jump scare kind of way, but just really brutal and kind of unsettlingly horrible. Yeah. I mean, there's a few things like that. Like even the moments when Freya is like trying to get people to say things mm. and it's not it's not scary and it's it's more like an attack on him as a person he's a psychiatrist mm. psychologist whatever he is and he's like speaking to the old lady Ursula and shaking her because she's not saying anything like tell me what you're saying and he does the same thing to a like 10 year old autistic kid like you know where is he what did he I'm like no good demonstration of his desperation though very much but mm. yeah it's like that the film talks a lot about grief and the desperation and because mm. he needs to, they need resolution. Uh, but the way in which he tries to go about it just made me feel deeply uh, awkward. Icky. Yeah. And the, of course, the central kind of plot point, which for me was one of the most unsettling, was of course the the way that Benny died. Um, yeah. That he climbed into a sewage a septic tank. A septic tank, yep. And then essentially was trapped there, I guess is is the assumption. And I mean, if anybody wants to watch the orphanage, turn off for the next five seconds. But the parallels with the with the story in that that it turns out that the the boy, her son that's gone missing, has just fallen mm. through a step and basically starved to death in there. Or d died in the basement. Ugh, and he's been mm, there the whole time. Very, very uh it's similar. So horrifying like weirdly more horrifying than if he'd been murdered somehow mm. I, don't, I don't know but it's that thing of um it's like a long slow death sustained death and well i mean to the same extent bernard as he probably died overnight but just trapped i mean he's not trapped but just in a place that mm. you can't escape from and you sort of like they're just there till they die and benny being in the bottom of that septic tank because i think freya says he's he, he's got diabetes uh, and he had his insulin shot, but he hadn't. If he didn't eat, then he would have gone into shock. Well, hopefully, then it was quick. <laughs> a little bit quicker than than that, but he ends up in the bottom of this septic tank because they're playing hide and seek, which kids do. You always want to hide in the coolest place, but that's what I really liked. And having literally eight hours after having read the novel, which does a very, if not quite the same, a very similar trick of the, the chronology and the timelines. Mm totally forgot and seeing seeing the footage of Gartha Leaf and Katrin coming out of the petrol station mm. I was like oh yeah yeah oh my god how did I not realize it was that quite, would you call it a twist because for me uh, it felt like a twist yeah I think and I think a lot of people might think it's a bit of a cop-out but it's a it's a storytelling device which in this case worked perfectly yeah yeah, it, I thought it was fantastic. Can I ask you something about the the when we kind of finally get the timelines converging mm. and we have Freya going to hysteria, hysteria exactly, and uh, uncovering the body of Benny, and then he sat in the house, isn't mm. he? And the basement is open. Or yeah, so he gets open. he goes upstairs, doesn't he? And then he hears the noise. And the basement doors open. The, this this Which door that saying, people can't seem to see. Exactly. It's saying, come find me. Hello. And he just kind of looks in it and goes, meh. Closes it. To you, what did that mean? Because he knows about Bernardus. He knows this whole thing of Benny 
Benny was woken up by Bernardus. Mm. Bernardus summoned Benny and was trying to get somebody to discover his body. The longer he lies there, the more malevolent he is. He's been told all this information, right? But I guess he has never seen anything. Ex- mm, he has seen explicitly supernatural things. He saw things. Bernardus, yeah. So what is his motivation when he basically goes, looks in the basement and goes, nah, let's go. Is he saying, fuck you, Bernardus, this is the end? Oh, I'm just going to leave you here. Or is he or is he ignorant? I'm not 100% sure. It's very very ambiguous. I I think I want to believe that he's had enough. He's got his son. That's all he cares about. Mm. Which is not a good thing for but his he, character. But he's obviously He's very he I mean he's established from the start as a as a kind-hearted person, right? Mm. A caring person. So to me it would seem like a weird move to be like, "Hmm, Maybe there is a body down there, but not my problem. I don't know that he knows 100% that there is a body of Bernardus to be found. But I think for most people, you would at least stick your head in, wouldn't you? <laughs> I don't know. Find a couple of corpses. Yeah. yeah you'd it's, be it like, is a... this is creepy. Somebody... Uh, th- my, Guys, this thing just What opened. I would do is say, somebody else go and have a look yeah. down there. <laughs> yeah, I assume he's just had enough. Like, it's been three years since Benny died. So three years mm. since Gartha, Leaf and Katrin were there. So he's got, I guess, no real reason to believe any of them are under there. But Bernardus, yeah. I think he's just had enough, hasn't he? Mm. He's just like, I've got my son. That's closed. I'm the not rest bothered of about not this creepy concern. basement. No. Um, It's always creepy basements. Creepy basements, creepy attics. I feel like horror films need to look for some more creepy bathrooms, maybe. Creepy boiler cupboard. I mean, cabinets. there's definitely plenty of films with creepy <laughs> bathrooms. Don't worry about that. Um, yeah, it's... I, th- I feel like it, with that moment, the film forgets to end the Bernardus story because Downey's still investigating the Hatler, sto- Hatler investigation, which happened to tie in with Benny's story. But we never see any conclusion to... Presumably it would just roll dying. on. Like, is Ursula going to die now if Bernardus isn't laid to rest properly Mm. because that would stand to reason he's still alive he's got his mum figure but he's still surely angry at the children especially Ursula who's the only one who knew where where he'd gone on that boat yeah why didn't we follow that through this is a thought I'm having right now (laughs) Uh, so I'm a bit yeah somewhat confused about that I did love the the very final ending though where we see Freya walking away from the house and in the window we have the ghosts of Katrin and Bernardus mm. holding hands. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, it's the Ooh. two of them, both the scenes where the two of them are, in it are the saddest scenes of the film, I think, mm. and creepiest. Mm. They're, they've obviously got this bond, but Katrin looks like she doesn't really want to be there. She looks like she wished she'd been found, mm. but no, she hasn't. So sort of is in allegiance with Bernardus now. It's quite a um, unforgiving end, you know. Quite. I was assuming that they would find Benny, then they would find the bodies in the basement. Everybody gets buried in the cemetery. They're all laid to rest. Mm. The demons are assuaged, as it were. Yeah. And it's all kind of peaceful. But it chose not to do that, really, didn't it? It was quite cruel to its characters, which I quite like yeah i mean we do we want to see a happily resolved ghost story I don't they're not think usually we do. that happily resolved like we know that the way to do it is to find the bodies and lay them to rest but even in what is even in things like the ring where she thinks that's what she needs to do it's not what she needs to do and i love that or drag me to hell yes exactly i love that film or woman in black actually does the same thing does it yeah. Can't remember that. Didn't Where that. they basically are like, oh, it's all dealt with. Don't worry about it. We're giving a lot of spoilers for the horror films out there. The I'll put a spoiler warning. <laughs> and at the very end, the woman in black is still pissed off. Mm. I mean, those kind of final moment tags that horror films do, where the thing that you thought was finished isn't finished. That's kind of an annoying cliche. But in this case, it's not like they've gone post-credits. 
ah, they're still alive. It's used in a much more kind of, this is just a quite sad. It's more subtle, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. I really so love that. So you took it as a sad ending because I guess you could take it as she got the son, I mean, albeit a demonic ghost son, <laughs> that she had lost and was after. He got the mother yeah. that he was always looking for. Completely, you could you can say that, but neither of them got found. And mm. if they'd been found, they wouldn't even need each other. But yeah, but you're right. Maybe Katrin was like, well, at least if I die here, I'll have a son, which is fucking horrible. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> um, the only real happy moment is that Freya finds his son. So he's got closure. Are you calling that a happy moment? Not, well, he finds happy a dead body the wrong, of his son. <laughs> okay, happy is probably the wrong word. But he's finally like, it's over that. Yeah. I can move on and hopefully his wife can move on. Um, they don't really explore their relationship. In the novel, she's very, very, very stuck in her grief. And the medium is the only person who can give her, has been giving her any kind of help. But what I did like in the one scene they have together at the house, I don't know if you spotted it, but on the wall, there is the cover of Sigur Ross's album, Algaitis Birgen. And it's this angel fetus drawn by a guy called Gotti Beerhoft, who's a... Icelandic artist. I didn't know that was what it was. I did clock the fetus artwork though. Yeah. Is this a little Easter egg? Yeah, I think so. But what's really cool about it is that that piece of artwork is titled A Good Beginning, or Argaitis Birgen means a good beginning. And that phrase alongside this image of the fetus, I think ties in really nicely with the whole theme of having lost a child and maybe they're starting afresh. I think it ties in well with what you were just saying about Katrin and Bernadus. They were having this sort of weirdly new beginning as mother and son <laughs> in death. Mm. I don't know. I just... I'm sure you can read quite a lot into it, but I yeah. really liked... I was like, initially, oh, a cigarros Easter egg, but then it has a little bit more meaning to it than just yeah. that. Yeah. Um, All the threads of the parent and child thing mm. woven throughout. So... Yeah. Obviously, Freya and Benny, the artwork <laughs> that you've just mentioned, Katrin losing her child, Leaf having another child, Bernadus losing his mother. Even uh, Downey, which is different to the novel, is that she's teaching a children's choir. Mm. Now, I'm not sure if they just put that in there for bingo. us. Bingo, yeah. <laughs> choir bingo. I literally wrote, we should keep a tally because I feel like it's we're probably on 80% choir appearances of the films we've seen you i think yeah it's not it's not 100 percent. So, I did some calculations on this. Yeah. And by my calculations, six out of the eight films we've watched so far have choirs in them. Wow. So, clearly, there is an obsession there. Yeah. It's completely tied into the culture of Iceland, I suppose. And for that, surely the only reason it's in this film, because... It had no relevance in this film. it It was to set up... A creepy boy in the choir staring at him. Who didn't really have anything to was do with anything. Was it even really real? What, the creepy boy? Yeah. But I don't think he was Bernadette or Benny. So no. I think he was just a starey child. Just there to freak Freya out a bit. Yeah, exactly. Weird. Talking about sort of uh, Easter eggy type things. I don't know if you spotted the foxes. I did. Yeah, the, the black, black the, furry foxes. The They're black amazing. Arctic foxes, yeah. So I was like, that's cool. I'm pretty sure they don't get mentioned in the novel. So perhaps this is some kind of symbolism that uh, the director had put in just as an extra sort of layer. And it turns out, I'm just going to get my notes here, (laughs) that black foxes can be seen as a bad omen. Really? Yeah, generally. That makes sense. Like black cats. Instantly makes sense. Uh, And in Norse mythology, they have this idea of a thing called Fulgia, Mm -hmm. which 
are animals that perhaps accompany people in their lives or on their way to death. Like familiars almost. Yes, yeah, sort of like familiars or I think it's fetch in like Irish mythology. And they sort of relate to the character of the person. And oh, almost like demons in um, the Philip Pullman books. I haven't read them, but yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, and so a, a fox often relates to a person with an untamed nature. Uh, which, Bernardus. Yes, perhaps. I was thinking more Catrin. Because mm-hmm. I think she, you can see them as she's looking out the window quite often. Oh. Um, but also, it's an animal that accompanies them in relation to their fate or their future. And sort of acts as a portent so then Catherine seeing one so someone if you see that sort of fulgia in real life kind of thing that sort of acts as a kind of like bad omen like the for black, one's the black dog yeah for one's impending death that's specifically a black fox if your fulgia is a black fox then that's sort of a sign that impending death is coming so if anyone here is going to Iceland and sees a black fox take extra care on the roads absolutely yeah, I'm trying to remember because when I was in the Westfields, we visited a Arctic fox sanctuary and I'm trying to think if one of them was black. Possibly was. And I did nearly crash the car. <laughs> so, Coincidence? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, but I thought that was really interesting because we haven't really talked much about Icelandic sagas or the mythology at all because none of the films have really mm. tapped into that. But having random black foxes around felt like it needed to be looked at. Yeah, they were quite noticeable. Mm. So yeah, I quite I quite like that, that Catherine sees these black foxes yeah. and then, you know, she does, whether she chooses it or not, she does die. Mm. Any other little Easter eggs or points that you'd you'd seen that you wanted to talk about? So when I got to the end of it all, I was thinking it would be really interesting to watch it again, knowing that we were working on these two different timelines, mm. one three years ahead of the other. And watch how that all changed your understanding of it. So the septic tank, for example. Did you spot that on the boat and then outside the house? I wonder if I did, but I don't know whether that was just me thinking, oh, yeah, I would have seen that or not. Yeah. Um, But I didn't think of it outside the house. And I wonder if knowing that that was there, did you spot it loads? Was it shown much? It's shown quite explicitly three times. And on the first watch, I was like, oh, green septic tank on the roof. But I had already forgotten the ending of a novel, which is why I haven't really spoken about the ending of a novel, because I can't quite remember how it finishes. But I'd totally forgotten that there was this kind of overlap in time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was like, there's the green septic tank. But knowing that it was there didn't make the surprise of the (laughs) the time stuff any less shocking yeah so that was my question for you is like had you noticed it and when both ursula and oli mentioned the green and the green submarine whether that meant anything no to you. no i don't think it did maybe i was being really blind there no, I, but think... I think it's such a like um a nothing of a item isn't it it's oh, so, completely it's just a background thing that you wouldn't think of yeah absolutely that... it's not it's not exp- i mean it when you know it's there, it's quite mm. obviously a big green thing in the middle of the shot. But it's not the th- something you would expect to be paying attention to mm. in a ghost story. Exactly. In the first sort of 15 minutes. So I'd be interested to watch it again, knowing how it all transpires and see where the little clues are laid. Mm. The second watch for me made me appreciate it a lot more because I was watching it just as the film rather than an adaptation of a novel. Mm. And I just thought everything tied together really well. Mm. It seems quite slight. And yeah, the police stuff is really kind of just glossed over. But the the family stuff, the ghost stuff, and how that all comes together, I thought just was really well done. And it yeah. came to a satisfying conclusion, mm-hmm. apart from the bit that we already discussed about how Hatler yeah. and all of that doesn't get... I would agree. I think it was a satisfying end, wasn't it? And the kind of... Satisfying in its lack of resolution, mm. almost. Yeah. Um, I, I do like a film that does that. I like films that leave you with questions. Not, I'm not saying that this film does that particularly, but I like films that end with questions or just sort of make you think and maybe make you think about, you know, how sad things can be. 
which isn't night i'm sure most people would rather a happy ending but i quite like quite like especially a ghost story which should be sad it kind of stood stood by its own convictions didn't it, it didn't mm-hmm. cop out and give a little merry ending no not at all a merry ending <laughs> so all in all i really enjoyed it um, and i would urge people to watch it but also maybe give it a rewatch not necessarily four days after the first time you watched it but because i don't think a film demands should have to demand a rewatch but it certainly does help just notice these things that make it a bit more satisfying mm. but other than the storytelling itself well, do you have any kind of favorite uh characters or even just shots because it looks incredible yeah it does look incredible favorite shots i think just some of the shots of the house yes surrounded the external shots of the house just stood on its own looking creepy Mm -hmm. um against an incredible backdrop i in thought they were very impressive i thought yeah that whole town looked creepy as fuck the whole time and but also starkly beautiful yeah i know we've talked about how iceland is just one of the most stunning countries and even in its creepiness it still looks incredible Mm. and i think obviously part of that is down to the way it was shot um so a a big shout out to cinematographer jacob ingerson Mm -hmm. who um was he obviously knows what he's doing made everything look yeah stunning even like dilapidated boats and yeah the hospital as well the hospital was creepy when he's running around Mm -hmm. looking for his son in the lift (laughs) yeah not nice and i thought in terms of characters that frere did a very good job of being a very kind of warm presence initially and and a kind kind of gentle presence so that when we saw him as you say, shaking an old woman Mm. or a small boy saying, tell me where he is, that we were sympathetic with that and forgiving of that rather than just like, oh, what a twat. What a twat, exactly. (laughs) You're a monster. But um, (laughs) so I thought that that character development was was set up well so that we were on board with him and on side throughout. Yeah. I think between Freya, who's played by Johannes Hoike Johannesson. Top beard. Top beard. He's appeared in all sorts of stuff. I think he's in Game of Thrones and and various other things. But I think it was between him and Katrin for sort of best... Mm. I don't want to say best acting. That sounds stupid. But she was incredible, I thought. Mm. Playing this this woman who's had a lot going on, is dealing with a lot, even just in life. And then she's got this ghost tormenting her. And then she's got to deal with this extra news that her husband's been cheating on her mm. and it's just what you need when you've been haunted by a ghost to also find out that your husband's having an affair yeah i think she did that really really well and um yeah, katrin is played by anna gundis guzman's so amazing performances from those two mm-hmm. should we play a bit of actor bingo go on then so did you recognize anyone in this one so i recognized leaf so leaf is the Icelandic word for life. At one point, they make a joke about yes, that. Yes, very nice. Um, as the daughter of Erlender from yeah. Jar City. Absolutely. Augusta Eva Erlendsdottir. But it did take me a moment. I thought, is it Magnair from Let Me Fall? Because mm. they've got quite a similar look. And it did take me a little while to to make that connection. Yeah. I mean, compared to Jar City, we're on about nine years later in real life. So she's a oh, bit yeah. older, which mm-hmm. makes sense because if she was in her 20s, they seem to be in their 30s, mm. don't they? So, yeah, there's one for your bingo card. Any? Do you notice anybody else? Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, I the green smile thing. on your face. Okay. Um, a guy who's been in several things, made a very brief appearance. So brief that I'm like, what even, what, what even was his role here? Kiddy. From Rams. Yes, Theodor Juliusson, yeah. Exactly, uh, he came was, back. He was playing Hatler's husband, who very briefly yes, they thought yes. might be the reason that she killed herself. Which again took me a little while, but I got there. But he was quite sympathetic, I mm-hmm. thought. Like, he came across very well. Not like his character in Jar City <laughs> at all. Not. Or even Rams. Like, he was much more kind of soft in this yeah. film. Uh, I did love that he. Was, they spoke to him for like one minute and then Freya instantly was like, it's not him, is it? <laughs> and I love how Freya was, on a, on a few occasions, was just like, 
so it's not him or that means that or you, yeah. you just draw conclusions instantly and, and they would just be correct. like okay fine <laughs> yeah yeah sure, sure but he wasn't given much to do was he but his short appearance he did it very well absolutely yeah so that was it. I don't think we had any other sort of overlap with actors in this uh, in this film, but okay. we'll likely see them all again. Here's hoping. Here's hoping because it's nice to see different people, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and we also hadn't haven't touched on director Oscar Thor Axelson, who we've not seen directing anything else. He has also directed episodes of Trapped, which mm-hmm. we've talked about, the Cormacur TV series, which is almost upon us series three is nearly here so it could have been quite easy for him to just make this a crime procedural with a ghost attached but actually for me it felt much more of a ghost story than a crime procedural which Mm -hmm. was good because we've you know it's on telly a lot we see a lot of it we've we've watched our jar city our nordic noir that's Mm. specifically that so it was really nice to have this kind of ghost story i think he did a really good job of making it that rather than a uh, than a nordic noir on its own Mm -hmm. you know Uh, so hopefully we'll see him again but coming up we're going to be going back in time yes you know me and i love going back in time (laughs) (laughs) we're going back but not i mean not that far this is a podcast about 21st century films remember (laughs) Uh, so we're going back to 2003 okay and we're doing a film called noe albinoe what's in store what's in store you say um well Less scares. Mm-hmm. We're back to our comedy. Okay. I think we're going to see a Black bit of comedy. bit of Icelandic humour at work. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but we may also be in the fjords again. Back to the fjords, yeah. where we belong. We spent a lot of time in Reykjavik. And actually, we did go to Reykjavik for a brief sojourn in this film, <laughs> didn't we? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, let's stay up north for a bit longer. Well, I'll see you next week in the fjords. See you there. Spooky stuff. Thankfully, my experience of the West Fjords was nothing like that, even as a blonde-haired, blue-eyed young man. In the summer, it's a delight. And while I remember, I must give a shout-out to Churahusith, the fish restaurant in Isafjorda. I'm not really a fish eater, but the buffet of fresh fish straight from the ocean was delicious. Have you been to the West Fjords? What was your experience like? Did you try the fish? Or spot any ghost children? Or perhaps you saw a bored teenager break into a museum or steal a car. I only ask because the title character of next week's film, Noe Albanoe, or Noe the Albino, does just that. Dago Kauri's quirky deadpan comedy shows just how cold and boring it can get in the remote towns of the West Fjords. Noe Albanoe is available on Apple TV to rent or buy, or if like me you live in Bristol and still own a DVD player, then 20th Century Flicks have a copy for rent. And one final reminder to join us on the socials where we're at Kvikminderpod. And if you could leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, we'd be really grateful. See you next week. Tak bless. Thanks and goodbye.